Hello and um, welcome to Celtic Australia's podcast. I'm here with Michael Tomolaris, who's um, a very big man in sports journalism in Australia for all of you in Scotland. Um, and he's actually known um, Ange Postacoglu for, well, basically his entire adult life. He's um, been uh, gracious enough to join us today. Um, welcome um, on board, Michael. Thanks, Gavin. Good to be here. Uh, um, um, you're in Adelaide at the moment. Yeah, look, I'm in Adelaide. I've just uh, done a documentary on a cyclist, a 59-year-old uh, journalist, former journalist, actually, who's ridden his bicycle from Darwin, which is at the top of Australia, down to Adelaide, where I am, which uh, is a total distance of almost 4,000 kilometres. He took a detour, mind you, to Uluru, Ayers Rock, that big rock in the middle of the country. Uh, he's doing it for a couple of reasons, to, to uh, train for a big event in the United States called Race Across America, and also for uh, mental health awareness. Uh, we're documenting it. And I've seen some of the country I've never seen before. Australia is very, very big, let me tell you. <laughs> I've actually lived in Darwin and in Alice Springs. Um, I did six months in Darwin. I did four months in the Springs. Um, when I was in Alice Springs, it was in a February 2000, and, oh, God, I'm showing my age here, 2009 no, 2008, and there was something like 10 consecutive days above 40 degrees. And uh, mm. they said to me, um, I was like, God, how hot is it? And they go, look, mate, even the locals are complaining about it. You know it's hot when the locals complain <laughs> about how hot it is in Alice Springs. But one well, you must have been there in uh, the summertime. I'm here in the wintertime, and um, it's in the desert. And even though it is uh, hot when you, uh, when, when you were here, it's freezing cold in the mornings. You're down to zero degrees. Yeah. That's the desert for you in Australia. Yeah, oh, look, I, I was there from February till uh, May. And in May, I had a job. I used to ride my bicycle and in freezing cold. I couldn't feel my nose, my ears or my lips by the time I arrived at work. It's absolutely insane. And then, of course, but the good thing in winter, you've got that beautiful sun. Um, anyway, getting on to the football, Ange Postacoglu, um, it's a bit of a surprise for a lot of Celtic fans. He's a bit of a bolter. Um, we were chasing Eddie Howe for a good long time. It didn't, it fell through. And then straight away, we went back to Ange. Now, there's a bit of conspiracy. People, so on one hand, they're saying he's been tracked for a great deal, many um, months and years, even sometimes in the papers. Uh, others are saying it's a panic appointment. I myself have been to a, a great many um, Socceroos games. I, I've loved Ange's philosophy. Unfortunately, I, was, I saw us in 2014 in Brazil where we were given a poison chalice of Chile, um, um, Holland and Spain. Um, but we, we, we still played some great football there. I was absolutely fortunate. Probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in football was the 2015 Asian Cup. Watching us win it at home um, still always gets the goosebumps on, up on me. Um, and we saw how Ange took a broken team and how he fixed it, how he took a lot of a tired squad and how he regenerated it. Um, what do you think about Ange? You've seen his career for, um, well, for the length and breadth of his career, how would you describe the man and his ability to, to take on the challenge at Celtic? I've known Ange uh, since the age of 21 when he was a player for South Melbourne in the National Soccer League of Australia. And uh, in those days, back in the early 1990s, I was commentating on football. And I can remember one day when we were in Melbourne, uh, we're generally from Sydney, but we were in Melbourne uh, um, commentating on his match. And he had uh, been injured and he wasn't playing, but he came around to the commentary position and started asking me questions. He was very curious about how the whole outside broadcast set up is actually set up. So I got to know him there and then. He was a very curious human being way back then, away from football. And I think that curiosity has taken him to the levels of uh, uh, coaching and as a player prior to that uh, during his career. Look, Ange is inquisitive and he likes to learn. He is definitely the best coach that we have produced from Australia. And don't forget, uh, Australia did uh, very, very well at the 2006 World Cup. Sure, it was before his time when the Socceroos uh, made it to the quarter, uh, the round of 16, oh, 16. before losing to Italy. Um, but uh, Ange has won two national titles here in Australia. Um, he won the Asian Cup, as you say, in 2015. And look, Asian football is quality football. To win that tournament is a huge feather in his cap. And that's the reason why Yokohama took him on. He spent two seasons there, took a broken team to a championship level 
And uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, Scotland and Celtic in particular is after his services. I think the Celtic supporters will be surprised. Sure, they they are surprised at the at the signing, but uh, they'll be more than surprised when he delivers results. And I believe he will. Oh, I'm actually one of the I'm one of the minority, but I'm a vocal minority on this. Like I've been telling everyone who wants to listen, and is a quality signing. Um, look, the, the one thing about Ange is that his footballing philosophy is a very progressive one. He likes to play out from the back. He, he, he likes to um, he likes energy in his football. He doesn't just punt the ball long. He never parks the bus. Um, I remember there was um, talk. A journalist asked him a question like, "Well, are we going to be a little bit more cautious? You know, with uh, some of these bigger games coming up at the World Cup?" He said, "Look, you know, if you, you want us to play defensively. It's just not going to happen. I'm going to have a, a red hot crack at them. You know, when in that World Cup we had uh, Chile, we lost two one. Um, in that game, um, Tim Cahill had a goal chopped off for being marginally offside, and he was offside. But like, you know, we were so close to getting a draw out of that. That was a magnificent Chile team." Um, then you're talking about we went up against Holland. In the entire World Cup, only one team led against Holland. Of course, they got knocked out on penalties, and that was Australia. We were 2-1 up against Holland. Um, and, uh, well, we threw that lead away, but at the same time losing 3-2. But we're the only team at the World Cup um, to lead Holland. We had a red-hot crack at them, and they were a magnificent defensive team to score two goals against them. Um, then, in a dead rubber, like, we got turned over by Spain. Uh, 3-0 but at the same time we still had a go at the world champions we're talking about like not just the world champions but the European champions at the same time Um, and probably one of the best Spanish teams you know in the history of that nation we still had a go at them and he's going to go in there into the football at Celtic he's thrown in the deep end sure but he's the sort of man that he can he can rise to the um, challenge Uh, like you said with Yokohama I believe they were about 18th or they came 18th or something like that in, when he took over and then you know there was the rebuild and then next thing you know they're the champions winning um the the j league as well this is not an easy thing um a, a lot of people outside of europe or a lot of people in europe aren't going to give asian football the credits it deserves but the japanese league is a far harder um league to win than most leagues in, in I europe i totally agree with you gavin i think it's time for the scots the uh, british and even the Europeans uh, far and wide to have a lot more respect for Asian football, particularly in Japan. Why do you think a lot of uh, Brazilian, South American players end up there? Sure, uh, the pay packets are good, but the quality of football is exceptional as well. The Japanese team, they dominate uh, the Asian uh, um, Champions League as well. Um, To win the J League after taking the squad from 18th to Premiership Championship material, is is a tremendous uh, attribute for Ange Postacoglu. It's time, I believe, that Scottish football woke up to the fact that uh, the Japanese league, I'll make a bold statement here, is stronger than the Scottish league. Apart from uh, Scot- uh, Celtic and Rangers, two teams that continuously dominate, the J League is up there amongst the best, if not better than the Scottish league. So oh. I think it's time for a little bit of respect. Oh, I agree. Um, this is one thing I've said, like to win the Scottish League, you have to be the manager of one of two clubs. Basically, you know, at the start of the every season in Japan, there's half a dozen teams that are championship um, candidates. Um, straight off, it's, it's a very, very balanced league. It's far harder to win the, the Japanese League than most leagues in Europe. Have a look at the moment. Um, in Germany, Bayern has a mortgage on the championship. You know, I mean, um, Juve have won about nine of the last 10 or something like that in um, in, in Italy. Um, you have a look at Spain. It's, it's well, there's Atleti pop up every now and then. The rest of it's just um, Real and Barca, you know. Um, in yeah, Japan, it's I, a very I, balanced game. Yeah, can I just say, this is a great opportunity uh, for, for Ange, apart from uh, trying to lift... Uh, uh, the championship uh, with uh, Celtic. It's a great opportunity for him also to become the first Australian coach uh, to take a team to the European Champions League. And uh, I think that's his main goal, main ambition uh, in signing up with Celtic. Sure, it's a, a great opportunity to bigger and better things in Europe, but why not start with a, um, a, a, a wonderful club with a terrific history than uh, Celtic? Yes, well, this is one thing, and this is almost a bit of a poison chalice. Um, if Ange had been brought in a, a month, two months ago, well, you know, um, it would be much better for him. He'd have more time with the rebuild. Obviously, he's got quarantine issues as well in the UK. Um, he's got to do about a fortnight of uh, self-isolation. 
Um, but this is the thing. We have Champions League qualifiers in mid-July. So he, he, he's going to get out of quarantine, go straight to the training ground, inherit a squad which is coming back from the European Championships, players that want to wait, needing to bring players in, and boom, he's thrown straight in the deep end. Now, the first few qualifying rounds of this are generally quite easy. That said... Celtic fell in the third round to Ferenc Varosh of, um, of Hungary last year round, and it torpedoed our season. Um, Neil Lennon went out and complained about the players. He threw them under the bus, and they didn't want to play for him. Um, the club at that stage, they should have either sacked him or they should have sold the players. You know, they, they, he lost the dressing room, and uh, it was just a slow death. It was, a, oh, it was an incredible season last year. We seriously don't want to get into it. <laughs> um, it's early morning here. It's a bit too early for me to get the whiskey out. But um, put it this way, with Ange, he, he could pretty much say that he's going to get some teams from the minnows early on that he should be able to get through um, with whatever team he can play, patch together. But he's going to need some signings early, and uh, then... Well, we go through four rounds, um, Celtic or Scotland, to get to the um, Champions League, but he's a chance of doing that in his first season, his first month. Yeah, well, uh, I wish him all the best, and I think if anybody can do it, it's Ange Postacoglu. I'm not exactly sure what the draw is, Gavin. Perhaps you can tell me what teams that he is playing, uh, uh, Celtic are playing, uh, before uh, the proper competition starts. Um, we haven't been um, drawn um, as yet, so uh, but mm. we're waiting. But look, Generally, we're going to get some... T Last year, we got teams from uh, Latvia first, then we got a team from Iceland, then we got a team from Hungary. Then you get teams in the playoff round and this, that, the other. Oof, you, there can be some hard ones. Um, the other thing is, this year, we're not in the champions draw. Um, before this, there was just um, one team from Scotland who got it. So if you get through the champions draw, you'd only play against other champions. So that means you didn't come up against the, the fourth best team in um, England, for example. Now we're not in the champions draw. We're in the, um, you know, in the qualifying draw. We could come up against all sorts of horrors um, in that playoff round, let alone. And that that's speaking quite highly because we didn't make the playoff round last time around. We came up against AEK Athens um, a couple of years back and they, they knocked us out. Um, obviously, the Greek League is very strong as well. Um, but um, we'll have to see. Um, but um, again, this is the thing with Ange. Ange, is, he's a left-field candidate for, for many, but for mine and from what I'm hearing with yourself, he, he's a man of pedigree and he's a man that, you know, he, he rises to challenges. Hopefully, he can rise to this one early. And if he can't get into the Champions League, it's a massive hurdle to jump on such a short notice. Hopefully Celtic fans and the board can give him this time. Um, he, he deserves um, the respect of being able to, to get this window out of the way, build the team um, which can um, relate to his uh, philosophy and then be judged over the 38-game season. I think so. Uh, give the guy a chance. Uh, it's uh, not a usual thing for Scotland to have an Australian coach in its on its books. Uh, just be patient, Celtic. Just be patient. Uh, that's what Ange wants. Just patience. And uh, look, he'll deliver. He doesn't do things in halves, by halves. Um, I think you've got the right man for the right job. Celtic will go far this year, this oh, season. I'm glad to hear because I actually believe the exact same thing. One thing, of course, at Celtic, we have uh, Tommy Rogic um, uh, at the club. Now, one thing with Tom, he's been plagued with injuries and he's turned almost into a 60 minute man. We, very rarely get a game, a 90-minute game. If we do, he's generally not playing the next one. He's on the physio bench. Um, we've, we've had a little bit of luck with rela relation to um, two teams which had plastic pitches. Both got relegated. Um, so um, whenever the, we came up against Hamilton or Kilmarnock, we just couldn't play him because he'd be out for a month after you know running around on that concrete. Um, so I'm thinking this could be a very good thing also for the Socceroos um, that – Ange is going to be able to get the best out of um, out of Tom in a at a club level, and hopefully that's going to flow on to um, Graham Arnold's national team. Well, let's hope so because Rockage, uh, as the Celtic supporters know, is quality. It's a shame that he hasn't really fulfilled his full potential. Um, when he was younger, I saw him as the next Mark Baduka, oh. a former Celtic player as well. But unfortunately, injuries has have played his his career. Um, there will be a good relationship between Ange Postecoglou and Rogic, and um, let's hope uh, let's hope that uh, he does come good because I think Celtic needs a player like Rogic at full capacity. Um, okay, so anyway, um, 
lots of um, big news ahead for Celtic and for Ange Postacoglu. Um, thanks very much for your time today, uh, Michael Tomalaris, and uh, all the best uh, um, back in Australia. Have faith, Celtic fans. Postacoglu will deliver. I can't reiterate that enough. It's been a pleasure, Gavin. Thanks, mate. Bye. All right, mate. Bye-bye. Thank you.